All right, welcome back. Just a few more slides and then we'll be done. All right, so I'm gonna hide me so you can see this a little bit better. All right, so sound waves, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, they're gonna result from the alternative compression and decompression of air molecules. That's the fancy way of saying waves of sound, okay, sound waves. Um, and so depending on sort of this, let me kind of draw this. When we talk about frequency, what we're talking about are the waves, right? So here's a frequency, here's a faster frequency, and it's my, <laughs> don't mean to make it any sharper than that, it's just my bad drawing. Here's like a, a lower frequency sound, right? And so basically when we, what we hear best are frequencies between a hundred, I'm sorry, a thousand and four thousand hertz. That's a cycle per minute. So one of these from peak to peak would be considered one cycle. Okay. Um, but most people can uh, perceive a range of 20 to 20,000 uh, hertz. Okay. Um, anything above that or below that, again, you know, again, some people can hear it, but for the most part, no. All right. The vol when we're talking about volume, we're going to measure that in decibels. And that's basically its intensity. So now we're not looking at how wide or close together these waves are, but how big they are, right? So we're going to look at something like this. It's going to be a lot louder than something like this, right? It may have the same frequency, but this one is much louder, okay? Um, in general, conversation is around 60 decibels, and anything over 140 uh, decibels is, is actually hurts our ears. And there should be an H in here. Um, that's OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, Administration. They require ear protection for jobs where sounds um, are above 90 decibels. Help protect hearing. All right, so when we, we just saw this. So when we see the wavelengths change, they're the same height, so they're just, they're equally loud. Um, but the frequency changes, that means the pitch changes. So this might be a low frequency sound. This may be a higher frequency sound, right? So it'd be a higher pitch. That's what we're talking about. James Earl Jones versus Mickey Mouse. Okay. And then loudness will depend on the amplitude. So in this case, these two waves have the same uh, frequency. However, you can see again, this one's much smaller than this one. So this is quieter than this one. And then timber is the quality of the sound. Okay, so each one of these has the same loudness, same frequency, so it's the same note. But timber is basically the quality. It's the difference between, you know, a novice blowing a C on a bugle ver versus, you know, someone who plays for a symphony blowing that exact same C. There's quite a difference in quality of that note. Timber is also the quality of sound that allows you to differentiate between a C being played on a piano versus a C being played on a horn versus a C being played on a guitar. Okay, so that all of that is, is timbre. That's the overtones of sounds. There's different types of deafness. There's nerve deafness and conduction deafness. So nerve deafness is due to usually nerve damage, right? It's that vestibulocochlear nerve. But sometimes the hair cells themselves will be damaged. Antibiotic drugs uh, particularly tend to damage the hair cells. They kill them off. Um, sometimes those high-pitched sounds or very loud sounds will also kill off the hair cells. Sometimes anti-cancer drugs will also kill off the hair cells and affect hearing. Conduction deafness, on the other hand, has nothing to do with the nerves, right, and, or the hair cells. Those are fine. However, the sound can't get from whatever's producing the sound to those hair, hair cells. So for example, if your eardrum is, is broken, or has a hole in it, it won't vibrate, right? Think of like a sail with a giant hole in it. It's not gonna allow you, you know, a sailboat to move. Same idea. Um, sometimes those, uh, those, those uh, inner ear bones actually have to be able to move back and forth in order to cause vibration. Sometimes you'll have them fuse stiff so they won't vibrate anymore. If they don't vibrate, that sound will never get to the cochlea um, and then it'll never get to the hair cells. So in general, the vibrations for some reason are not being conducted to the hair cells. Right. Um, again, just kind of uh, continuing along with giving you guys the pathways for these things. Um, 
so the fibers are going to go to the medulla and then they'll, they'll decussate to the other side. Um, they'll go to that inferior colliculus and if you remember back that inferior colliculus is what's going to orient your head and trunk to um, sound, to different sounds. It will relay in the thalamus before going to the auditory area, right? It's that primary auditory area and then uh, to the association areas. Again, you don't necessarily have to worry about this. I'm not going to ask you for like what's this step and this step and this step. Uh, you probably have all heard of cochlear implants. Um, if the problem is due to the hair cells not functioning, these cochlear implants uh, will send that information directly to the nerve. Um, and then from there, it'll go to the brain. Now, the cochlear implants have become amazing over the, oh, um, over the past five years or so. They used to only be able to submit or transmit, rather, very crude sounds for the individuals who had them. But these days, they can understand speech, as long as there's not too much other surrounding noise. Um, and what's interesting, too, what people will say when they first turn on the cochlear implant for them, everything sounds high-pitched, kind of like Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse voice. And it takes the brain a little bit of time to get used to the different sounds, and then eventually the sounds will actually go, I guess, will drop in pitch. So, you know, like, people will have different, they'll actually be able to distinguish between people's voices that they don't all sound like Mickey Mouse. But that that's done at the brain level, which is kind of, again, amazing how the brain actually interprets and changes all the information coming in. So the difference between perception and sensation once again. All right, so let's go on to balance. So here's this, so now we're out of the cochlea and we're into the vestibular area. All right, so here we have the vestibule, and then we have um, the semicircular canals, and then we have at the base of the semicircular canals this enlargement called the ampulla. And if you do yourselves a favor, you're going on to 202. This ampulla, whenever you see ampulla, that, that always means that there's a tube, and the tube get, where the tube gets larger, it widens, they call that an ampulla, right? You'll see it over and over again in 202. So you might as well just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. So how does this work? All right. So from the vestibule, you see those semicircular canals, and they're arranged in, basically in the X, Y, Z axis planes. Okay. Um, and again, you see that they enlarge in the ampulla, and then in the in the semicircular canals, we're going to have ducts, and in those ducts, we're going to have fluid, and we're going to have specialized structures. Not unlike, excuse me, not unlike the hair cells we saw in the cochlea. Okay. So in, in equilibrium, we have two different types. There's static equilibrium and then dynamic equilibrium. Basically, the difference is, and you probably don't even realize it, but right now, just you sitting, wherever it is you're sitting, um, you have, your body is basically maintaining its equilibrium. People who get vertigo get dizzy and disoriented simply sitting or even laying down, okay? So it's so the static equilibrium lets you know, like, I'm sitting, I am not falling, I am not swirling down a whirlpool, I am not going to tip over, I am, I'm fine, I, I understand where my head is, I understand where my body is relative, you know, to the world around me. Now, dynamic equilibrium is basically what allows you to tell, you know, what is up and what is down during movement, either acceleration or deceleration. And... Um, I mean, this is this is kind of important. Like, you know, if you're running away from zombies at full force and you got to make a left turn real fast, you don't want all of a sudden get dizzy because you turned. You want to stay upright and running and be able to make these kind of sharp cuts and, and quick movements left to right. And that's all part of this dynamic equilibrium. Okay. So we have these things for um, for static equilibrium. We have these two different organs called the saccule and the utricle. Okay, um, and they'll also contribute a little bit to dynamic equilibrium, but let's just take a look at, at what they look like and how they work, because this is really neat. Okay, so here in the vestibule, we have this utricle and saccule, basically these um, sacs, if you will, these areas. And again, we're going to have this idea of these hair cells being embedded in a membrane. Okay. Um, so basically these cells are in this membrane and on the top of this membrane, can you see this term right here? Are autoliths. Those are ear stones. They're calcium carbonate crystals. They're basically little rocks 
in your ear. So when someone says, you got rocks in your head, you go, yeah, they're in my ear and they're helping me maintain my static balance. Thank you very much. Um, but what this is going to do, and this is so neat, is because those, those crystals are a little bit heavier than the, the jelly, when you tip your head like you can see this person doing, the force of gravity pulls on those rocks, which pulls on the jelly, which then causes those hairs to bend, and then basically the exact same thing that we saw in hearing happens. By bending those hair cells, we're going to open up ion channels, and a positive ion is going to go into the cell, causing depolarization, which then sends that signal to the brain. And the brain goes, oh, okay, you tilted your head forward, right? Or side to side, or whatever it was. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Now when we talk about dynamic equilibrium, again, this what we're talking about is going to be motion. Again, very similar setup, slight variation. Oh, and my disc is almost full again. Okay, slight variation. So now here we are in the ampulla of those semicircular canals. So again, we're gonna have fluid, we're gonna have this jelly-like substance. They call it a cupula now because it's sort of this long dome instead of just sort of like a, I don't know, sheet. And again, we're gonna have hair cells embedded in it, okay? So basically, when you move, so the fluid is going to move, okay? And basically it'll bend the, cu the cupula, bend the jelly, okay? So let me kind of give you an idea of that. So you're gonna move your head, fluid is gonna flow, which then basically causes this cupula to move. It moves, it bends, it causes the hair cells to bend. The bending of the hair cells causes ion channels to open. Positive ions go into the cell, causes depolarization, that um, depolarization then sends that signal to the brain, and your brain interprets it as, oh, okay, I just turned my head to the right. You don't have to fall over all dizzy. Does that make sense? Hopefully with hearing, you're really seeing this pattern. Okay, the, the general pattern of hearing is that you have these hair cells, right? And as the hair cells bend with whatever jelly that they're embedded in, either that tectorial membrane, um, uh, for hearing, or the, the cupula, or the, that autolith jelly, um, what's going to happen is you're going to have the bending of the hair cells. As they bend, ion channels open, positive ions come into the cell, the signal gets sent to the brain. Now if it's coming from the cochlea, the brain knows to interpret that as sound, right? And then, you know, it, it's talking, it's English, it's this word. This word means whatever, right? And then, so that sends to different uh, brain regions. When it's either uh, in the in the utricle or saccule um, or in the ampulla, the brain knows to interpret that as, all right, I'm sitting here, all right, I've bent my head down, I've looked up, versus I'm rotating my head or I'm moving, okay? Brain simply knows how to interpret that. And obviously, things can go wrong. In fact, people who experience vertigo, um, often they have problems in those semicircular canals and they get dizzy and off balance even when they're sitting down or even laying down. Right. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, that's it. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed all these lectures, and I'll see you in class. Bye.